for oxygen. Some organisms have what are called compressible gas gills. And so basically these are temporary gas stores. So the organisms that go up to the surface to get a bubble, that's a compressible gas gill. Basically that's what it's called. It's a temporary gas store and they can hold them under their wings or sometimes attached to hairs. And so this is like scuba diving. So scuba stands for self-contained underwater breathing apparatus. And so humans, we can take a tank of oxygen down with us, but eventually the tank runs out. Now, the crazy thing is we haven't figured out how to do what beetle, diving beetles do, because these insects, they can actually top up their air while underwater, taking advantage of Fick's law and these, um, these diffusion gradients. So the way it works is that um, all of the air, they take air from the surface, right? And the air is a mixture of oxygen, nitrogen, a little bit of carbon dioxide. Well, the bubble that they, they bring down with them, the CO2 in the bubble leaves really rapidly because it, diffuse, it dissolves very rapidly in the water. But so that leaves behind oxygen and nitrogen mainly. And as the insect uses the oxygen, the diffusion gradient increases. And so oxygen from that's dissolved in the water actually diffuses into their bubble. And so they're, they're taking on additional oxygen the entire time they're down there. The nitrogen gas, because of the diffusion gradient, slowly diffuses out, causing the bubble eventually to shrink but at a much um, slower rate than would happen happens in a human scuba tank where we just use up all the gas and we're done and we can only last, you know, like 45 minutes an hour max. These beetles, um, they can stay submerged for days or weeks because their bubble, um, their bubble is constantly being regenerated. Um, when temperatures are high or when insects are very active, they tend to use up the gas faster. And so they can also slow down their metabolism if they're running low or if it's dangerous to get to the surface for some reason. Some um, of these beetles have um, setae, which are, you know, little hairs, basically are these little projections. Then some of them have tracheated setae, meaning that there are tracheoles in the setae and they they kind of like little hairs under the elytra extending into that bubble that they can um, use to access that air in addition, or they can use to pull dissolved oxygen out of the water and kind of add it to their bubble. So they can kind of pitch hit, pinch hit a little bit. All right. There are also what are called incompressible gas gills, and these are what are called plastrons. And a plastron, it's kind of a, bear with me, it's kind of a strange concept, but it's basically a region of the insect's body that's covered with millions and millions of little bent hairs, kind of like Velcro, okay? And the, the hairs trap oxygen. And then that trapped oxygen acts as like a giant, um, Ox, a, a giant gas store, right, all along its body. Um, so these are dense mats of hydrofuge hairs. So for example, when I get in my dry suit and I go into a lake, I have all this Velcro on it and immediately like it starts bubbling, right? And so all these bubbles are kind of coming off of my Velcro. Well, it's probably because the, the weave isn't tight enough, but it's kind of like that. The Velcro had trapped air on land. And then when I walked into the water, it got pushed off the, the plastron, if you will, of the Velcro on my suit. But an insect's Velcro would be much, much tighter, um, kind of weave with a lot more hairs and probably um, you know some oils and things to keep the air in place. And so just think of it as this thin layer over the surface of the insect that's actually storing water. Sometimes it gives them this weird sheen if you're looking at them in an aquarium or something. Um, and then this surface, this plastron surface would be connected to functional spiracles where the oxygen, and again, the oxygen would be diffusing into the plastron from the water kind of refilling it, if you will, and then moving that oxygen into the spiracles. So the only problem is that things like surfactants and soaps in water can then reduce the effectiveness of the plastron and the sporacular gills. So if this poor organism then, you know, swims through like a bunch of soap bubbles from someone's laundry machine, um, all of a sudden their plastron won't work as well and they might suffocate. 
Okay, oops. Um, so moving on to a closed tracheal system. A closed tracheal system is one where there are no spiracles. So they're not accessing air directly from the surface or from an, a bubble or from a plastron. Instead, they're accessing all of their oxygen the, in a dissolved form from the water. And so there's a lot of ways to do this. Most of these organisms have to have um, fine tracheal branches that extend into some um, area just below the cuticle. So they can take some oxygen in directly from their body surface because they have tracheoles right, uh, right along the body surface. So at, at thin parts of cuticle, they might just, dis that dissolved gas might come right into their body. Um, and um, they can, um, this can allow for rapid diffusion of oxygen into the trachea and rapid diffusion of CO2 out. Um, they might also have features like the, the gills on a mayfly, where the tracheals extend into some um, really thin, delicate structure um, that has a very thin cuticle and allows for a lot of CO2 out and oxygen in. Now these organisms, because they don't have spiracles, they can't breathe atmospheric air, they don't survive for very long out of water, um, but if you keep them moist, they can survive a little bit longer. So um, they need really large surface areas to get enough oxygen from the dissolved state. And so they often have these tracheal gills. So organisms like mayflies, stoneflies, and amsoflies all have pretty large um, gills, some of them. Um, and we, you can also see that sometimes they have what are called opercolate gills. And those are gills that cover up other gills. And I'll show a picture of that. So you can see some mayfly gills in the diagram with the tracheals extending both out into the gill and then back into the organism, moving those gases in and out. Here we can see on the far left some fuzzy, um, gills on the underside of a stonefly. So often kind of like armpit gills or neck gills on stonefly. In the middle, you can see the um, caudal um, filaments of an odonate. Um, so those are some large gills. And then you can see the operculate gills covering up some of the more feathery gills on a mayfly. Okay, so these closed tracheal systems, they need movement. So um, they need a current or some kind of ventilation. If the water is too stagnant, they can't pull enough oxygen from the water. So these organisms often live in cold flowing water. Remember there's more dissolved oxygen in cold water and in flowing water. Um, some of them live in tubes or cases like the caddis fly there on the side. You can see lots of filamentous gills on its abdomen. Those gills would be inside a case. And so the caddis fly would need to kind of undulate or move its body inside the case to keep water flowing through the case and to um, oxygenate those gills. Sometimes you'll see mayflies kind of doing push-ups um, on the rock surface and they might be trying to move more water past their gills. Or if you stick them in, um, you know, like a little cup or something and you're watching them, they might start doing push-ups because they're like, oh my gosh, the water's not moving anymore and it's warming up now and it's fine. I'm finding it hard to breathe. Um, and then this picture at the bottom is a, a dragonfly larva, Anisoptera, an odonate and they have internal tracheal gills. And so they have to pump water um, kind of into this spiracular opening at the back end. Um, it's a pretty large opening. They pull water in and that oxygenates their gills on the inside and then they push the water out. And so in doing so, they can also um, move through jet propulsion. There are many adaptations to maintaining oxygen diffusion. So um, what happens when oxygen is scarce? Um, a few organisms can be classified as oxygen conformers, oxygen regulators, or oxygen stressors, according to the diagrams. Um, there's a little more simplified in your book, but this is the, these are the figures from the original paper. So for all species, there's kind of a threshold um, where you know they kind of want oxygen to be at, of course, higher saturations, um, but there's a low kind of threshold at which 
you know, you start seeing a rapid decline. So oxygen conformers tend to live where oxygen levels are high because they're kind of conforming to whatever's available to them. Oxygen regulators can live where oxygen levels are low or in um, places where there are fluctuations. And that's kind of true with oxygen stressors as well. And then um, just last, there's a very few insects that actually have a blood-based gas exchange system. And so in this case, they have oxygen that then diffuses into their hemolymph, into their circulatory system. So everything else we've really talked about has been oxygen in the tracheal system. And so blood worms, which are a type of chironomid as shown in the picture, have hemoglobin and um, they live in these tubes on, in the sediment where oxygen concentrations can get quite low. And so iron is usually the core um, element in hemoglobin. It's shown on the bottom. Um, insects also have um, a compound called hemocyanin that can carry oxygen as well. It has a copper um, atom as a core, two, maybe two copper atoms. And then um, some insects use a copper-based hexamerin too, but they don't use it to bind oxygen, but to store other compounds. Um, and so there's only a few organisms that use hemoglobin um, to move oxygen through the hemolymph, but these organisms can persist in lower oxygen environments. All right, that's it.